good morning, church. How are we doing today? Yeah, good, good, good. Listen, I'm feeling, I'm feeling loved this morning. I'm feeling loved by you guys. As, as I was up here singing worship, I looked to, to my front rows, and I've just got some of my favorite people here on the front rows for me, and that makes me feel super loved, and I hope that you guys feel loved this morning. I hope that when you walked in, you felt loved. So can this just be a room where we all feel good about ourselves and, and good about each other? Can we do that today? Yeah, okay, two of us are going to do that. That's fantastic. That's fantastic. Hey, if you're new here this morning, find one of those two people, and they'll make sure that you feel loved and and comfortable this morning. No, no, for real. We're excited that you're here. I am happy that you're here, and I know that everyone here feels feels good and loved this morning. I'm starting a series today. It's going to be over the next three weeks, and it's called Did God Really Say? Because we're going to tackle some of the core issues and the core questions that we wonder about. And today we're going to look specifically at something where we think, where we ask the question, well, did God really say that? But before we get into that, I need to build a little bit of context for you. I need to build some, some backstory for you. And, and so I want to ask you guys a question. Um, it's kind of probably a silly question, but I don't know who in here believes in conspiracy theories. I, I don't know if, if you're one of those people that really believes that, that there are conspiracy theories worth believing in or if they're all crazy. But I, I've got a couple conspiracy theories for us to look at this morning and, and these are things that, that I've heard about just over the years. Chemtrails, birds aren't real, the moon landing was fake, and then flat earth. Now, everyone probably has somebody in their life or somebody in their family that believes in one of these things. So chemtrails, this is where when you see the airplane flying over the sky and it leaves that, that trail of smoke behind it. Well, there's people out there that believe that that is like a brainwashing fog that comes down and, and infects everybody. And there's a lot of people that believe in that. Uh, I'll skip birds aren't real because I've got something special with that. The moon landing. I mean, so many people have proven and disproven that we actually went to the moon and that we walked on the moon. I personally believe that we did. Flat earth. Hey, if you believe that the earth is flat, I want to live in your world because you live in this blissful world where facts don't matter and it's just wonderful. And I, I want to be there because then I could choose to be happy about anything and everything. Now, the funny thing about birds aren't real. This is a real conspiracy theory. And it was started by a guy as a joke. And this joke was that, that he wanted to give people an outlet to kind of poke fun at the media and poke fun at how conspiracy theories spread. And so he started this theory that birds aren't real, that they're all government drones. And then what happened is even though it was a joke, a whole bunch of people now believe in it. And so a whole bunch of people out there believe that birds are not actually real and that they're drones. Now, it's kind of crazy to think that people could believe this. I mean, it, it is. And, and it's so, it's actually kind of addicting to read about these things and to look at these things and look them up online. And, you know, this is a, a rabbit hole that I can really go down on the internet. You know, you start out uh, researching a sermon and then before you know it, you're reading about birds aren't real. And then it just follows through a Wikipedia page where you're clicking link after link after link. But so anyway, but part of why it makes it so easy for us to get to this point is where we get our information. Now, where we get our information today, this is dangerous. This, this is very dangerous because we no longer have a lot of credible sources. And in fact, we as a, as a people don't even need a lot of sources. We just really need to see one post or one uh, person to say it. And so he, here's where we get our info. YouTube, did you know that right now, YouTube is the number one place where people go for information. They're no longer going to Google, they're going to YouTube. It has surpassed Google's search engine for people seeking information. Then we've got Google, you know, if you wanna know uh, my back hurts, you Google my back hurts, and before you know it, you know that you have a terminal illness and you've got <laughs> cancer and something's wrong with you, you know, you can easily go down the WebMD rabbit hole there. Twitter, this is where all the angry people get together. So if you want to be angry, you can jump on Twitter. Facebook, this is where your mom or your aunt is talking about something, you know, and she writes a post about how the world is ending or the government's taking over. Local, this local thing is, is our, our newspaper, our local newspapers. And then people, this is the one where it's, have you heard this? And have you heard that this person said this person, that this person said that? And I just want to ask you, what kind of a person... Are you, are you a one-post Facebook source kind of person where you just need to see it one time on Facebook and all of a sudden it's fact? 
It, it's, just, it's just proven fact. It might as well be written in the Bible. This is a fact because my aunt reposted this article on Facebook, and it says this thing. Or I don't know if you only believe in local people or, or YouTube or Google. But the issue that we have here is we have this incredible just fire hydrant of information. It comes at you from everywhere, and it comes strong, and it comes in a steady stream, and it never, ever stops. When you pick up your phone or you turn on the TV or or whatever it is, that, that, that device that you have, you just get flooded with information. Now, this can be used to our advantage because we can learn amazing things. I mean, because of YouTube, I know everything there is to know about assembling or deassembling and reassembling a tractor engine. I don't have a tractor, but I know how to do it because I've watched hours and hours and hours of videos on these guys that take things apart and put them back together. They're my wife's least favorite thing that I have on in the, in the house. So that may be something good, but for many of us, this is a really bad thing because here's what comes out of all these sources and the fact that they're not vetted by anything is we live in what I would call an age of misinformation. Now, this age of misinformation, this is is not unique to us. We're not the first people to, to be here. We're not the first people to be looking to incredible sources or uncredible sources. It's happened since the beginning of time, and that's kind of what we're going to talk about. This age of misinformation um, goes all the way back. I mean, I was thinking of some examples. I don't know if you guys have heard of the Salem witch trials in, in America, where all it took was somebody just to say, this person is a witch. You just had to look at somebody and accuse a, mostly a woman of being a witch, and then she would be put at the stake and burned. And guess what? If she lived, then she was real. If she burned, then she was a witch. That doesn't make any sense. But it was misinformation. It was just people spreading this. All all that had to happen was somebody had to say it. And and because of this age of misinformation, we've seen, especially on things like Twitter, we've seen movements like Black Lives Matter go from being something that could be positive to something that's negative. We've seen political elections be influenced by different countries. We've seen people get swayed into uh, hysteria over an issue that, that didn't even start to be that way. You know, we get pulled in so many different directions, and we get pulled not, not gently, but you get pulled in an extreme way because there's a whole bunch of misinformation out there. Now, if this can impact our society, if it can impact our culture, if it can impact the way that we see ourselves in society or the way that we see ourselves within our own culture, then it can also impact, and it even has a greater impact on, on this, but it can impact what I like to think of as like your, your core beliefs, your core questions. And so if we look at our core questions of who is God? Okay, who is God? Who is this God that, that we come to church? If you're new here today, maybe you don't know a lot about church, you don't know a lot about God, I would encourage you to ask the question, who is God? No one expects you to be able to answer that. Who is, who is this thing, this God that people call the creator of the world? Who am I? What is my purpose? Why am I here? Why did my life turn out the way that it did? Why does my life not turn out like other people's lives? What what is it about me that makes me me? But who who actually am I? And where do I fit in this world? Where do I fit in society? And then the third thing I think is, is what is the best way to live? How do I live this life out? How do I go about my day the best way? How do I get the most out of life? How do I be kind or be nice? Or or some of you maybe think, how do I get the most from people that are around me? How how do I take advantage of people or take advantage of life to its fullest? But these core questions are really influenced by the misinformation that we have around the world, that we have in our news. And then there's another kind of source of misinformation that comes, and a lot of times it comes from up here on stage. It comes from, from, from churches, from pastors, probably from me at times, not on purpose, But it's where we tell you something or we walk you down a journey or down a road about God or about Jesus or about your relationship with God or Jesus, and it maybe isn't all the way true. You may be misinformed about what God thinks about you. You may be misinformed about what you're supposed to think or feel about God. But this misinformation, it can impact us in a huge way. And so what I hope to do with this series is I hope to clear some of that up. My hope for you through this series is that you walk out of here knowing who God is and and how that relates to you. You may choose God. You may choose not to follow God. That's not my job. 
My job is just to tell you who God is and to tell you who you are in relationship to God. I want you to walk away from the next three weeks and know, who am I? I, I would say that everybody in here, at one point or another, doubts, who, who am I? Why am I even here? What is the purpose of my life even being here today? And, and I hope that you walk out of here and you know how to live. You know how to get the best out of your life. And so to tackle this today, to tackle this idea of how do we turn misinformation into real information? How do I find the truth? How do I know the truth about my life? We're going to look at, we're going to take it all the way back to the beginning. Like the beginning, the beginning, the beginning. We're going to look at the Hebrew creation narrative. And th this is the creation of man. Now, this is something that we find in the book of Genesis. So Genesis was written by, just a little context around Genesis, written by a guy named Moses. Moses is the same guy that would lead the Israelites out of, out of Egypt. He's the guy that they made a movie out of, that he went up on the mountain and got the Ten Commandments. Moses is one of the most famous people that even people that don't know the Bible well, they know a little bit about Moses. And so when Moses is writing Genesis, Moses has this idea that he wants to get across to us in the book of Genesis. And that idea is centered not around like how God created the world. See, if you're familiar with Genesis chapter 1, it's, it's, it's a story about God creating everything. God creating the world, putting order to things. And that's in Genesis 2 and Genesis 3. But Moses is, is not trying to get you to understand how God created the world. Moses is trying to get you to understand who God created the world for and why God created the world for us. And so Moses is trying to reunite the purpose of God with us as people. He's trying to reconnect us. Because as we're going to read today, we am almost immediately split from God. And Moses in Genesis is trying to pull us back together. And so in Moses chapter 1, and in, or in Genesis chapter 1, and in Genesis chapter 2, you guys can go back a slide. In Genesis chapter 1 and Genesis chapter 2, the thing that, that, that Moses wants us to take away from that is, is that God made Adam, and then God made Eve. And when God made Adam and he made Eve, he gave them some directives. So he told them some things to do. He told them two things that they were supposed to do, and he told them one thing that they were not supposed to do. So they had three rules, three simple rules to live their life out by. I wish that that's all that I had was three simple rules. But turns out we can't obey three rules, let alone a million. So we might as well have a million because we're going to break all of them. And so God gives these three rules to Adam and to Eve. And God tells them, I want you to fill the earth. So God is saying, I want you guys to get frisky with each other. I want you to enjoy each other. I want you guys, I mean, you're both naked all the time anyway. I want you guys to fill the world. Go and make babies. I mean, that sounds like a pretty good first rule. <laughs> the second rule is God says, I want you to subdue the world, which means that everything that God created is to fit underneath Adam and Eve. And so he says, you are going to be the authority over everything in the world. So there's nothing that's above you. That means you get to walk freely in the world. You get to name all the animals. You get to subdue everything in the world. Everything in the world sits at your feet. I mean, that's, that's a pretty good deal. And then the only, the, the only thing that God says, I don't want you to do, is he says, oh, you know, by the way, there's one thing here. You must not eat from the tree of knowledge of good and evil. And so we'll actually look at Genesis 2.17. This is the verse where God says it. And he says it to Adam here. They're going to pop it up on the screen for you. And so in 2.17, God's talking to Adam. Eve has not been created yet. So it's just Adam. And God and Adam are sitting around, and God's been giving Adam directions and telling him what to do and what not to do and what he's supposed to do with the animals and whatnot. And he looks at Adam, and he says, But you must not eat from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, for when you eat from it, you will certainly die. So that's the one negative thing that God said you cannot do. Two things I want you to do a bunch of. One thing I don't want you to do at all. And then when God brings Eve in, you know, Adam is, is made to, to lead Eve. And so he shares these three rules with Eve. And with that, God gives Adam and Eve this, this purpose. And God gives Adam and Eve uh, power. God gives Adam and Eve pleasure. So this is what God wants for Adam and Eve. 
This, this is the intention of the creation of mankind and their relationship with God. So I just I want you to imagine, I want you to just think about God as this tender father walking through the Garden of Eden with Adam and with Eve. And he gives them three just simple rules because he wants them to have the best life. He wants them to be filled with love and passion. He wants them to not be afraid of anything. He wants them to have authority over everything. Adam and Eve get to just walk hand in hand with each other under the protection of God and all the angels. I mean, that's an amazing deal. And that is a loving, loving father. That's what God created for us. That was his original intent for us. But misinformation comes into Adam and Eve's life. And it's that misinformation that separates them from God, that separates their relationship from God. And that's why Moses is writing the book of Genesis, like I said, to reconnect those two together. So let's look at that. Let's look at what happens when this thing called the serpent enters into the relationship with Adam and Eve. And so we go to Genesis 3.1. And this is... The introduction of the serpent. Now the serpent was more crafty, subtle, skilled in deceit. So, so the serpent was the most crafty animal. And, and it's, it's, it's interesting that it's, that it's referenced to as subtle. Because it, it's extreme things that get our attention, but it's subtle things that easily kind of trick us into something or can change our mind or can influence us. It's just so subtle little changes along the way. And so the serpent was more crafty than any living creature of the field which the Lord God had made. And the serpent, which was Satan, said to the woman, Can it really be that God has said you shall not eat from any tree of the garden? Now, I want you to imagine this situation. The woman is sitting, maybe she's under a tree, or maybe she's by a rock, or maybe she's in a field, and the serpent comes up next to the woman, and guess what? The woman's not afraid of the snake. It's not like us encountering a snake in our life where we know that it can hurt us, where we know that it's dangerous. This woman has dominion over the snake. So the snake comes up to her, and it begins to speak to her. Now, if you're used to walking around in a magical garden naked with Adam, knowing that God is hanging out with you from above and walking through the garden with you, then it wouldn't be a surprise that a snake can talk to you. So Eve is sitting there, and a snake comes up and says, Hey, Eve, can it really be that God has said you should not eat from any tree of the garden? And what Satan does when he does this is he puts just a little bit of a twist on something. He begins to plant a seed in Eve. And that seed that he plants in Eve, it's it's this deceptive idea. And so Satan takes something that God had said, something that he knew that Eve had heard from Adam, and he he just twists it just a little bit. He said, is it really true that God said you can't eat from any tree, knowing that God had said that you can eat from any tree except for one. See how Satan kind of twisted that on Eve? That's why this is a a deceptive idea. It's because the serpent is planting in Eve, oh, this, this idea that's not exactly what God said. And so that inspires Eve to respond. Now Eve responds with, with the next verse, and she says, and the woman said to the serpent, she says, no, 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 let me clarify this for you. We may eat fruit from the trees of the garden, She's like, you're wrong. We can eat fruit from the trees in the garden. You say we can't eat fruit from any of the trees, but we can. Except for the fruit from the tree which is in the middle of the garden. Now, what I think is clever about this is God did not hide the tree with the forbidden fruit on it. God didn't want Adam and Eve to accidentally eat the fruit. It was in the middle. It was prominent. It was something that they knew was there. They knew it was there. The serpent knew that it was there. So the serpent has planted this deceptive idea in Eve's mind. And now Eve goes to defend that idea. And she says that we we can eat from any tree except for the fruit from the tree in the middle of the garden. God said, you shall not eat fruit. You shall not. I'm having a, a seizure here. God said, you shall not eat from it nor touch it. Otherwise, you will die. Now, did God say... Did God really say, you shall not eat from it nor touch it? No. God just said that you shall not eat from it. He didn't say anything about touching it. 
They could have played rugby with it for all God was concerned. God just said, don't eat from it. Why did Eve change what God said? See, Eve negatively modifies what God said. Eve takes something that she heard from Adam, and she modifies that and puts kind of a, a neg- an extra negative onto it. Now, why did she do that? Was it because Adam was a bad leader? Was it because mankind was created with free will to choose God and then therefore Eve could be unsure about her relationship with God? Is it because Eve was trying to overcompensate because she had been pushed and she had been challenged by the serpent? And Eve's trying to say, well, wait a minute. Not only do I want to communicate what God said, but I want to extra communicate it. Do we have any extra communicators in the room? People that overemphasize things? Yeah, I hear a lot of, yeah. I saw people pointing at other people. We have those people, and maybe that's what Eve is doing, but the bottom line is that Eve has modified something that God said. And when Eve modifies something that God said, Satan sees that as, as, oh man, I've got a way in. Now, Now, I've planted this idea. She has modified what God had said. And then Satan goes on here in the next verse. But the servant said to the woman, you certainly will not die. Now this turns out not to be a lie. This turns out to be a truth. For God knows that on the day you eat from it, your eyes will be opened. That is, you will have greater awareness. And you will be like God, knowing the difference between good and evil. You will be like God, knowing the difference between good and evil. See, Satan lays out for Eve. He says, no, here's what happens. God said you'll die. But let me tell you what actually is going to happen to you. It wasn't that God was a liar. It wasn't that God was was trying to hide something from Adam and Eve. It was that God was trying to make sure that Adam and Eve knew what they needed to know. Hey, trust in me and just don't eat the fruit. And so Satan unpacks this for Eve. She said, hey, it's okay. You're you're not going to die. And see, Satan is also playing on this thing. The the serpent is playing into into Eve's desire to be like the one who created her. See, Eve wanted to be like God because God was her creator. We were made in the image of God. So think about that. There's a desire to be like God. There's a desire in Adam and Eve to follow God. There's a desire in you to connect with God through spirituality. And if you don't believe in God, there's a desire in you to connect to something spiritually. What that is, is that's you trying to be like your creator because you were made to reflect your creator. You were made to be like God. And what happens is when the serpent plays on this, when the serpent talks to Eve about this, he convinces Eve that you don't actually want to be like God. What you want to be is your own God. And so what happens in in our lives as as we encounter things like this, a, a desire a good desire is then taken and it's distorted. And now we have this distorted desire in Eve. So this whole thing started with Eve having a conversation with the serpent. A deceptive idea was planted. The serpent capitalized on that. And then the serpent took a good desire in Eve and he just twisted it just a little bit. And then it became a distorted desire. See, the desire is not bad. It's the distortion of it that's bad. And so as we continue on in the story, the serpent is not done with with Eve yet. In verse 6, And when the woman saw that the tree was good for food, and that it was delightful to look at, and a tree to be desired in order to make one wise and insightful, so this is Eve, she's made the decision, I want to be God. I want to be my own God. I want to make my own decisions. I want to be aware. I want to know what God knows. I want to be wise like God. I want to be on a level playing field with God. So she took some of its fruit and she ate it. And she also gave some of it to her husband who was with her and he ate it. See, Adam's not off the hook here. See, what's happened here? Do you remember those three directives? It was, was, you know, be, be fruitful and multiply. The second one. The second one was to subdue everything on earth. So Eve and Adam have authority over this serpent. And instead of subduing the serpent, telling the serpent, no, this is not what God said. This is not what God spoke. 
Instead, they let something they were supposed to have authority over then have authority over them. And when they let that thing that they were supposed to have authority over have authority over them, then all of a sudden this deceptive idea becomes a, a, a distorted um, becomes something that is distorted, a distorted belief in them, and then the last thing that it becomes is a destructive behavior because they, they eat the fruit. Now, when they eat the fruit, you know, unfortunately, that's where mankind splits from God. And when you look at how that happened, we, we would, I would call this just misinformation. And the king of misinformation was, was the serpent, and, and just so that you see the, the, the full progression here, I've got it. It starts with a deceptive idea, a distorted desire, and a destructive behavior. See, wh- where in your life could there be a deceptive idea? Where could there be a distorted desire? And where could there be a destructive behavior? See, that, that, those are the questions that we should be asking. And those aren't the questions that I'm going to answer for you today because I, I don't know where you are in your life. I don't know what it is that you're going through in, in your life. But here's what I do know. I know that the purpose of this misinformation was to remove Adam and Eve from under the authority of God, to remove Adam and Eve from being the authority over everything that God had created, and to mess up that whole information and take a little bit of misinformation about what God had said, change it and twist it just a little bit. And then before you know it, They've made this destructive decision, and Adam and Eve would get kicked out of the garden. God would end up clothing them because they would become aware of of their nakedness. So they lost their ability to to, uh, freely multiply. They lost their ability to subdue everything on earth. And they broke the third one where they ate from the tree that they weren't supposed to eat. See, they were misinformed. Adam and Eve were misinformed. The snake strikes when we question who is our authority. See, that that is something that I want you to think on today. That the moment that you think in your life that you are your own authority, or the moment you think that you have authority over your own problems, because see, when we lost authority over everything over the earth, when God said, Adam, Eve, I'm going to make you so that you subdue everything on earth, And when when Adam and Eve decided to to not trust in God and decided to introduce sin into the world and that split happened, we we didn't get that authority back. And so now the only thing that we have is we have God's authority to sit under. But constantly, all day, every day, all you're hearing through every single social media outlet, through YouTube, through Google, through everything on the news, through your friends, through local people, at the pub, wherever it is that you go, is you're hearing, you are your own authority You make your own decisions about yourself. You are your own God. You choose what you want to follow. You choose who you want to be. You choose what you submit to and what you don't submit to. And so this moment in your life, where where are you today? Where are you this week? Where are you this month? Where maybe you can see where the snake has struck in your life. And the place where you'll find that is when you've lost the idea of who your actual authority is. It's no longer God. You're making yourself your own authority. Now, there's a purpose here that the enemy has for you. And I really I want to hammer this point home to you. Because you need to understand this in order to get freedom from this. See, I don't want you guys to live in, in this age of misinformation. I mean, if, if you look at Adam and Eve, and you could take Adam and Eve, and you could, ch- you, could, you could teleport back to them, and you could say, hey, don't do that. Every single one of us in the room would probably do that. We would go back and say, don't make that mistake. This is going to mess up everything for everybody for all of eternity into the future. You would almost feel a responsibility to do that. In the same way, in your own life, I want you to feel that same burden in your own life or maybe as as you're walking with your friends in accountability or in a small group. But help each other to get this because I don't want you to live under the authority of something else other than God. Why? Because I want you to live in freedom. Why is it good for you? Because not living in freedom is really bad. Not living in freedom makes life really hard. Not living in freedom makes life almost feel impossible. 
So if life is feeling hard, if life is feeling impossible, if life is feeling hopeless, if life is feeling like there is nowhere to go or nowhere to look to or there is no help or all the things have happened this week that have made life extra hard, the car broke down, you lost your job, something bad has happened with your family, people are sick, and if you're feeling like you're drowning in all of that stuff, can I just encourage you to ask the question, who is my authority? Because if you can say the person that is my authority is God then you know what? Everything's going to be okay. And you'll find peace in knowing that God's your authority, God is authority over everything, and that everything in that is going to be okay. And so I, I want you to wrap your head around this idea that the enemy is trying to plant ideas in your mind. And these ideas play into desires that get distorted. And if you let them, they will become destructive behavior. See, I know that I keep saying this over and over and over again, but this is something that needs to just seep through the cracks of you. It needs to get into, in, into the inside of you. It needs to become something that, that just soaks in and you think about. It starts with desires, and then your behavior gets distorted, and, and you do something destructive. It all comes down to who is your authority. So when talking about Adam and Eve... Adam and Eve, when you think about, okay, what is the first sin? What, what, what is it that caused this whole issue between us and God, that separated us from God? Is the first sin the act of eating the fruit? I mean, that's, that's a good question. And some of you can go and you can debate about that. Is that the sin, when they ate the fruit? So if, if Eve had taken the fruit and had pretended to, you know, could she have been like, I'm going to do it, I'm not going to do it, I'm, you know, is that the sin? Now, I think that the first sin was, was this here. The first sin is the unwillingness to trust that what God wants for me is only my deepest happiness. See, that was said by St. Ignatius of Loyola. Sin is the unwillingness to trust that what God wants for me is only my deepest happiness. See, I don't want you to live in, in this sin, and, and, when I, and I know that the word sin has this like horrible, kind of really rough connotation to it. But what if sin really was just this idea of you not trusting that God wants nothing but your greatest happiness? What if, what if sin is just you not understanding how much God loves you and how much He's for you and how much He just wants you to believe in Him? See, it's, it's this unwillingness to trust what God has and what He wants for you is, is only your deepest happiness. And that also ties into who is your authority and what is your authority? What are you making the authority over your life? See, it's these questions that I hope that you go home this week and you ask yourself. Who is my authority? And the easiest way to find that is to look at your week. Am I stressed about my work? Am I stressed about my inbox? Am I stressed about my car? Am I stressed about my marriage? Am I stressed about money? Am I stressed about my purpose? Am I stressed about how I think about myself and how I feel about myself? Am I constantly feeling like I'm not enough? Am I constantly feeling like I can't just make the grade or, or I can't keep up with my friends and family? Am I constantly feeling left out? Am I constantly feeling unloved? I, I hope that I'm hitting something that somebody feels. But if that's you, then that points so quickly and so easily to the fact that you have an authority issue. But the encouraging thing about your authority issue is that you have a God in heaven that is knocking on the door saying, I am desperate to be your authority. Because if you just let me be your authority, then all I want is your deepest happiness. And then when God's your authority... And, and you realize that all he wants is, is that deepest happiness for you. Then when you ask the question, who is God? And, and who is my God? Or I would ask you, who is your God? Then it's easy for you to say, well, it's the one that is the authority of my life. It's the one that wants my deepest heart's desires to come true. It's the one that loves me so much. And then when the car breaks down, you can say, you know what? My car broke down, but God loves me. I lost my job, but God is my authority. My job doesn't have authority over me. God has authority over me. Now, I'll share a quick story, and then we'll talk about this, and I'll, I'll wrap up the service. Casey and I, if, if you know us, if you've been around, we, for a long time, 
We were in a situation where Casey had a visa for us to be here because if, you, if you're new here, maybe under, you can notice that I, I don't sound like everyone else in here. And we're from America, but we've, we claim South Africa as our home. This is the best place. And so Casey and I were in a position where Casey had a visa which allowed her to be here. And that visa one day magically went from, from just fine to all of a sudden not fine. And, and somehow something happened in the system and it became an illegal visa. And we found out as we were coming from Swaziland into South Africa. And all of a sudden, we couldn't even get into South Africa. So we had this whole crazy story about going to a different border post, and there were dirt bikes involved and lots of distractions. And we had people praying, 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 and we ended up getting back into the country. And for seven years after that, we fought home affairs to get this visa sorted because Casey was put on the no-ban list. Or on, on, she was put on the ban list, the black list, meaning that if Casey left the country, she would never, ever be allowed to come back in. So we had lawyers that protected her so she couldn't be deported. And, and that, that, that kept us as a family safe. And for seven years, I asked this question of, of who's the authority here? Is it the South African government or is it God? Is it the, the government that made the, the corruption in the government, or is it God? And I would, I would ask, every time we went to a lawyer, I would say, like, God, you have authority over this legal system. This legal system is not above you. But man, that was hard to believe. And there were a lot of the days that, that we really struggled to believe it, and that sometimes we didn't believe it. Sometimes it was like, I just don't see how it's possible, God, for you to have authority over this government because nothing's happening here. And so for seven years, we practiced claiming that God is our authority and not a government. And God is, is your authority, not your broken down car, not your hurt marriage, not your lost job, not your out of control kids, not, not your family situation. None of that stuff is your authority. None of it. So everything that, that you've got in your life that you feel like is, is in charge of you, well, guess what? Today is a day where it cannot... It, you can let go of that. It cannot be your authority. There's one thing you can make your authority, and that's God. And seven years later, Casey and I finally, we got a phone call. And the ruling had been overturned, and Casey had been removed from the blacklist, and we had a visa for Casey. Yeah, they're clapping backstage, yeah. No, it was amazing. It was absolutely amazing. That was a big deal. For seven years, we claimed God as our authority. And for seven years, God said, I'm your authority. But for you to know I'm your authority, I want you to just claim it over and over and over and over again. See, God didn't become our authority when we got the visa. God was our authority the whole way along. After a while, the visa just became irrelevant. It didn't matter if we got it or didn't get it. God was our authority. And so I want to leave you with this. Who is your God? Are you your own God? Are you your own authority? What is your God? Another way to ask that is what is having authority over you? Should it have control over you? Or were you commanded to have control over it? And so I'm going to pray for us and the band's going to come out and they're going to sing a song. And what I want you to think about while we sing this worship song is I want you to think about what, what tensions are in my life because the tension will lead you to what has authority over you. And I want you to understand that that is misinformation because the truest information that you can ever have, the truest information that you can set, that you can bet the bank on, you can bet everything you have on, is that God is authority over everything. There is nothing under the sun that God is not in authority over, and therefore He is in authority over your life. So find your tension point. And when you find your tension point, ask God to be the authority over that area. Let's bow our heads and pray.